OK, so it's 2023 and I'm discussing soap services. What the hell am I doing? The world has moved on since soap. But before you click and move on, then just hear me out and you'll see why potentially there is a reasoning behind this video. So you might have, like many of us, existing legacy soap APIs and you've got some technical or business drivers that are requiring you to move on from that SOAP service that you have. So what are your options in this space? So option one could be that you opt to completely replace the SOAP API with some other replacement technology, so be it a RESTful API or GraphQL or gRPC, for instance. And that's a totally viable option, but that's a big deal. And there's definitely going to be changes required for your consumer of that API. So while that is a viable option, it is the biggest change and it's a complete move away from everything that you've got in your landscape today. So an alternative approach to that might be that consider that you've written your SOAP service in the Java space in something like Apache CXF or in the .NET space in WCF, then your option might be to use an upgraded version of those frameworks. So you stick with the SOAP service and you stay on Apache CXF but on a later version or you move to WCF core potentially to move um, away from the .NET framework to the .NET Core framework, .NET 5, 6, 7, 8 and onwards. Um, you'd need to migrate away from the existing Windows Communication Foundation framework and essentially use that code inside of a new framework. And that as well is going to bring changes potentially and that could incur possible changes required therefore to the consumer as well. So while that's a better option and possibly less effort required than the first option, it's potentially still not ideal, but might get you where you need to go. So option three, and this was the situation that I was in, is that the SOAP framework that you're on is in some deprecated framework or has been written in some technology that you no longer wish to support so you want to move away from it, but you still want to maintain the SOAP service. And the reason being that you cannot impact the consumer of the service at all. So you want a completely replacement technology for your SOAP service without incurring any changes. So the service itself has to look and behave exactly the same after your upgrade as it does before. And none of the approaches prior to this one have addressed this kind of scenario. So you're in a migration scenario and you want to move your SOAP service to something like .NET 5 from the .NET framework or some other implementation which is going to cause you to have to rewrite that SOAP service but you still need to create a SOAP service. So that's the scenario that I was in and that's the scenario that I'm addressing with this series here. If this is something that's of interest to you, then by all means follow along and we'll see where we get to with this. Um, but just a quick disclaimer, the SOAP services that I'm creating here are by no means implementing the full SOAP framework and all the associated WS star standards and everything else around it. It is by no means a fully fledged SOAP service. It's purely one that addressed the needs of my particular scenario. But my scenario did use WS username token. So we did have authentication and authorization requirements bedded into this as well to consider. So let's go and have a look and let's see where we can get to with this. OK, so let's start on this and see where we can get to. So I've got a brand new Git repository open and inside my Visual Studio code, the only thing that I've gone ahead and done is already installed the C-sharp um, and .NET extensions. As you can see, I've got a bucket load of other extensions here, but the key one that we're going to be using for this is HTTP YAC, and that's to do our HTTP calls. So as you can see here, it supports SOAP, which is kind of why I've picked it. So you need to have that installed so that you can run your test requests across to this API. So the first thing we're going to do is create a brand new 
web API. So let's go into our terminal and do a .NET new web API. That gives us the starter for our project. And the first thing I'm going to do is go into VS Code settings and select the workspace settings. And in here, I'm going to put editor format on save to true. Close that out. And in the program CS, I'm going to get rid of use HTTP S redirection for now. I'm going to get rid of authorization for now. And I'm going to turn off the swagger stuff as well. So all we have is a very simple API project now. So we're going to need some logging. So I'm going to do a .NET add package of serial log ASP.NET Core. And I should point out that this is running on .NET 7 at the time of this tutorial. So that adds serial log into our solution. So now back over here, I can add a using serial login up there. Then I can add a new logger configuration and we will read that from the configuration. The configuration comes from builder configuration. Then we can create a bootstrap logger from that. So that sets up at least a serial log instance for while we're bootstrapping our application. I can create a try catch that catches any exceptions and we log those out as a fatal problem, logging the exception and some message and then we also need a finally just to close and flush everything out to the log before we terminate so now i can put all of that inside the try catch save that so that it formats and inside the try we'll just do a log so that we can see that our web host is starting and then we'll also set up our actual serial log instance and this is the one that's then used inside the rest of our application while it's running so now over to our app settings and we can go and add our serial log section so we're not logging any debug information by default here so that's our default one so let's go and do the same again and we can just override some of those serial log settings specifically for our development so we are going to use debug ones and we elevate these to logging out information ones so let's close those let's add our Assets for building and debugging.net, which gives us our launch JSON. And in here, I'm going to get rid of this server ready action as that opens a browser every time, and we don't want it to do that. And now, inside of our controllers, we've got this weather forecast controller. I'm going to create a new controller called service one. I'm going to change the HTTP get to an HTTP post. And then I'm also going to put on here a produces application XML, which tells ASP.NET that we should be sending back XML rather than JSON. I'm going to change the name of this to just be post for now. And let's just fix up the name of this. Then back over here in the program CS, I'm going to change the add controllers to also add XML serializer formatters, which enables .NET to be able to send and receive XML. Now we need somewhere to store our test requests. So I'm going to create a folder called consumer test scripts and create a new file in there, service1.http. And I'm just going to put a comment in here to say that this is using HTTP yak, which is what the .http extension yak will look for that so that it knows how to run these. And you can see already that yak has picked up the fact that this file exists and we, we can now send in this post request to localhost 5175. So I'm just going to check in the launch settings and change the port to 5175 and 5175. Okay, so let's save everything, hit F5 and see what we get. So we can see if I go back through this logging out to the console here there was a blue line there we go there's our starting web host that we put in as so serial log is correctly logging out to the console which is good and the last thing that we see down here is that we're listening on http localhost 5175 so if we come over to our test we can send in a test request and we get back a 200 and we get back xml which is the array of our 
weather forecast. So the default ASP.NET weather API, but responding with XML. So that's a good start, but obviously this is not a SOAP payload in any way, shape or form. And this is not a SOAP request. It shouldn't work like this at all. So let's move on. So let's create a SOAP folder where we can put all of our SOAP bits and pieces. And I'm going to create a file in here called SOAP constants. And we'll namespace that under the SOAP namespace. And as you can see, I'm setting up a SOAP 1.1 namespace constant here. So depending on how familiar you are with the SOAP specifications, there are two versions. There are SOAP 1.1 and SOAP 1.2, and they have different namespaces in XML terms. So this is the one that you need to use if your service is a SOAP 1.1 compliant service. So we'll start with a 1.1 service. So now let's create a another folder under that SOAP folder called model. And in there, we'll create a SOAP header class. And these are just the model classes that make up a SOAP envelope, as you'll see. We've got a few of these to do. So let's go and add another one for SOAP request body and another one for SOAP request envelope. So the envelope is the top level container that the request sends in. So as you can see, the envelope contains both the header and the request body and sits in the namespace of our SOAP 1.1 namespace. So SOAP is where we're going to put the core of our SOAP classes. The SOAP folder is basically a folder that you could copy across between projects. What we then need is a specific SOAP folder. So let's have a model folder and a SOAP folder for where we're going to override those SOAP classes specifically for the service that we want to host here or want to implement. One thing I didn't maybe point out is all of these model classes are expressed as partial classes. The entire class is split across your project. So what that means that we can do is inside of our SOAP model here, specifically for this project, we can create a SOAP request body class, and we can essentially also define in the same namespace of SOAP model, a SOAP request body, and this will be merged with the core SOAP one to create a complete class when we compile it. So we can add our enhancements specifically for this project into our model SOAP objects instead of to the core SOAP ones. So all we've got is a couple of constants in here. What we need to do is make sure that the XML namespace that the SOAP body uses is the default namespace so that anything that we define inside of this request body will now fall into this namespace and not the envelope namespace. So let's add a SOAP operation into the request. So this is how you would essentially call a specific operation. So we're going to have a get weather forecast operation, which we define as a property and that returns a get weather forecast request object. So we need to create a get weather forecast request. So let's create a new file in the model called get weather forecast request. And that is just a normal plain old C sharp class. And now over in our controller, we can change our post to accept a SOAP request envelope. And we can change this from just returning an I numerable to an I action result so that we can return all sorts of different types of responses from successes to failures. So we just need to change this to return an OK result. So let's run this up and see where we get to. And now if we call our service, we now get an unsupported media type. And that's essentially because we're not passing in any payload. So if we pass in a content type of application XML instead, let's try that one. And now we're getting there. So now we accept the content type, but we're being told that the 
body hasn't been supplied as we would expect. So let's create another request and let's pass it some XML this time. So here we've got a soap envelope where it uses soap as the prefix for the 1.1 namespace. So the soap envelope is in the 1.1 namespace. The header is, the body is. Our service call is in the service prefix namespace. So if I just scroll across, you'll see that service has been defined as being in the namespace sum.com slash service. And if you remember in our model for our project in the request body, we defined a namespace as sum.com slash service. So they match. So this get weather forecast is in this namespace, which is exactly what we've specified here. So get weather forecast is in the sum.com namespace. When we send that in, as far as ASP.NET is concerned, everything is great. We get an envelope, we've got a body, we've got a get weather forecast object, although it's empty because there isn't any content within it. We do actually get a weather forecast, which means that we can then return our OK response. So we've got through the whole SOAP request element and passed in a SOAP envelope into our controllers post method, which is really good, but we're still getting back just the default array XML non soap response. So we need to go and look at how we can model that response. So let's close that down again and get rid of that request. And let's go and create a new soap response envelope inside of our soap model. So this is our core class. So let's just paste this in and have a look. So again, we've created a SOAP response envelope that's inside the SOAP 1.1 namespace. And here we're defining that this should contain a SOAP response body that we haven't defined yet. But essentially it's just a property that returns a SOAP response body that's backed by this body property here. So let's go and create that SOAP response body as well, which is just an empty plain old C sharp class for now. So there are our core classes. So let's go and override in our model for our project, the SOAP response body. So remember these are partial classes again. So we are overriding the core SOAP response body, defining some namespaces for our response. And we're defining a get weather response property that returns an object of type get weather forecast response, which could be nullable. So we need to define that get weather forecast response, which returns just an array of weather forecasts. And if we look, we've got this weather forecast class, which just contains the default weather forecast information. So it's just an array, a nullable array of those weather forecasts. So that's our response objects defined, but we need to go and change our controller so that rather than returning OK, we return a SOAP envelope inside of our post method. The first thing we do is create a brand new SOAP response envelope, and then we can set response.body, which you if you remember, creates it if there is, isn't one already. So it already gives us a body. And then we've got our get weather response property, which we can set to a new get weather forecast response. And we'll just paste that in and set weather forecasts equal to our list of generated forecasts and then we just return our OK response with our SOAP envelope. So let's save that, run this up, run our test request again and now we get an envelope. We'll see that the default namespace, so because this doesn't have a prefix on it, this is the default namespace for every element in this XML is the SOAP 1.1 namespace. So by default this element and this element are in the SOAP 1.1 namespace. And then this element and everything below it is then in this namespace again, because it doesn't have a prefix. So it, if you need to be confident with your XML in terms of what you're reading here, but it is giving us back a valid SOAP 1.1 response envelope and body with a get weather forecast response. We can see there that we've got a complete round trip of a SOAP service that takes an operation using XML and gives us back an HTTP 200 
with a corresponding XML SOAP response. So that's the beginnings of, of a SOAP service. But clearly we do still have some more work to do here. Like if I call that one, I'm still getting back a JSON problem details here, which you wouldn't expect from a SOAP service. So we've got some more work to do in that regard. And it's passing us back a status of 415 in that regard, whereas SOAP services, if they have any kind of problem, should be returning 500s. So lots of stuff to do. And also the SOAP versions, we've only handled SOAP 1.1 here. We need to handle SOAP 1.2 as well. WSDLs, there's a whole gamut of extra stuff. So this really is only scratching the surface on creating a SOAP service in .NET core or .NET 5 upwards. So we're going to have a look at some of those problems in future videos. So if this is of interest to you, then stick with this series. But let me know in the comments, are you dealing with legacy SOAP services? Is this something that you would find useful and you're maybe unable like me to use WCF core or move to any other kind of framework? Let me know in the comments. It'd be useful to gauge just how many people in the community are in a similar situation to me. And a quick thank you to my sponsors for sponsoring the channel. It does help me out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.